Amazon.com. When you think of Amazon, think King of Amazon.com. I am now recording my first podcast for the new decade, January 1st, 2020. About 12 minutes after AW Dynamite just went off the air. And since there was no overrun or anything like that for NXT, because of the reward show, I stuck the Dynamite all night. Pretty good show. Actually, one of their better shows they've done since they started. And it's a good direction for them also to be. I mean, it's not like NXT didn't put out a good show. They, I did flip in from time to time and I saw the awards being given out. So that was nice. And obviously, people will go ahead and tune into that, but not as much as in live in ring action. So Dynamite's going to get a chance to go ahead and take a nod, basically in an uncontested week. They'll take the rating win. And they'll probably get a pretty decent audience for January 1st because there wasn't much else on television to watch, except for the Rose Bowl if you're going to watch. But that, that would be the one thing. Is football going to matter with them or not? I don't know. Anyway, I'll leave it there. This is the Rest of Israel podcast. Thank you, everybody, for finding the show, listening in, as you always do. Interesting to start up another tw- a new folder for the next year, 2020, and to get things started on another program and to give a little perspective as we close things out. Monday night with the way that the WWE main roster, main roster decided to go ahead and close things out with Raw. Now, like many other podcasters out there, I am critical of the Lana Lashley wedding angle. We've seen this wedding time wedding angle many times. As a matter of fact, I had to go back and look, and I remember the fact that Roman Reigns interfered with Lana and Rusev's nuptials back in 2016. So it's not the first time that Lana's had a cake in the face. We get that again. And again, Lana and Rusev together in the same vein here for whatever it is, right? But I can't say that I'm going to feel the same about how this all ended up. I can't be as critical or I have a different criticism of how I felt everything turned out on Monday night, which is indicative of what kind of things that Paul Heyman, I would imagine, was instrumental in this kind of this kind of storyline, I would imagine. And if it's on Vince's television, he has to be signing off on it. So this angle, this storyline that happened in the main event with an overrun, we had a 30-minute segment with this. They decided to go ahead with this here. And I'm saying to myself, who asked for this right here to be so long? And who really is interested and invested in the storyline? Well, I'm not. We, we are pretty aware of that. And for me, when I looked at it, I mean, I've seen some of the same things. It, it, this is not anything new. It's been a while since they did a wedding angle. You know, AJ and AJ Lee and Daniel Bryan, you can remember that. There's other things like that. I mean, I'm just not big on the wedding angles. It's whatever it is. But again, the storyline is lost in transition because it's got to be about Rusev and Lashley. But then they decided to go and incorporate Liv Morgan into the mix. I know a lot of people were upset that Liv Morgan became this role here, being shown as a lesbian. And I wouldn't have had any problem with it. I thought if you want to add Liv Morgan to the storyline then don't let her fight with Lana. Have her kiss Lana, and they walk off. And Lashley's left without anything. I don't know, something else to it. And maybe there's some, I don't know what you could have done with that, but it was a train wreck. And the reason it was a train wreck is because that's what they wanted. Obviously, the company did not care about the fact that they were going to throw something out there that probably is going to anger many fans out there, and they did a pretty good job of it, right? I was outraged by the outrage. That's really what it comes down to, is because everybody got upset and pissed off about the storyline, and all of a sudden, oh, now you care about the main roster product. Oh, all this little talk about The Fiend, and then all of a sudden, The Fiend talk kind of dies down. Seth Rollins turns heel. Samoa Joe turns face. Now he's aligned with Kevin Owens. You have the Randy Orton storyline with AJ Styles, and that's interesting. And then you got people kind of building up things for the Royal Rumble and WrestleMania season coming up. You know, Becky Lynch now with a contract dispute, things like that. Okay, certain things that are coming in here to make the people happy. But you know what? There are just certain things that 
target this audience, this these the diehard WWE fans that get upset about everything. And my thing is, I, I mean, I didn't care for the segment, but what you have to talk about that is undisputable about the storyline is that the ratings went up as a result. And they did have college football to go up against. You had the Orange Bowl going on, which pulled in 6 million viewers. And in the middle of that, Monday Night Raw pulled 2.525 million viewers for hour one, 2.464 for hour two, 2.328 for hour three. So significantly, they pulled in probably an extra 500 to 600,000 viewers from the previous week. Yeah, it was a new show, but still, when you look at all that, you got to say to yourself, compared to the ratings they had previous, if I look at the ratings now, and I say to myself, all right, we go back to Raw at the end of the year. Remember, if you look at the average here, the average roughly 2.4 million viewers on Monday night. And if you look at Raw's ratings, they hadn't pulled a number like that since September 30th. Do you understand? you understand? The wedding actually drew viewers, and it drew enough to get people to stick around. Because you get 2.3 million, they were staying under 2 million for a while. This sparked things. And you know what? Publicity is publicity. Because what happened was, if you look now, the wedding, it's gotten so much, it's gotten so much press. You have to see what there is out there. If I do a search for WWE wedding, Okay, there are top stories that are come up now. 366 million results. And everybody, okay, they had some mainstream press. Sports Illustrated got into it. CBS Sports got into it. Bleacher Report, Newsweek, among others. They all put their hands into it. New York Post. Bottom line is they put some press out there and it got some press. People did talk about it. And there are different reasons why people are criticizing the storyline. So besides the fact that we, you know, as diehard wrestling fans, we've seen this all before. I mean, I watched it. I wasn't bored by it, but it was a train wreck I didn't really care for. So it is what it is. The other thing that got people all up and riled up is because of the lesbian storyline. So, from a story in the New York Post, Liv Morgan shocked the wrestling world by making her return in a bizarre lesbian storyline that didn't sell well with the company's real-life lesbian. Well, Sonya Deville then made a comment on Twitter saying, well, my mind is blown. And she doesn't have much to say after the fact. Now, what you didn't know, which some people, and I'll tell you what, for people to get outraged immediately after Monday night, it's funny how people did that. But then, you know what, just wait for wrestling Twitter. First of all, for the defenders, the White Knights to come out to go ahead and defend this storyline and try to defend Liv Morgan and the other things that are going on. Because there are people that are WWE denialists. Okay, they are denial people. They cannot allow themselves to feel like, oh, I'm not going to go ahead and, you know, be embarrassed by this company. I'm going to stand behind them. You know, it's what they are. WWE deniers. Well, when I looked at what was going on with Lana and Liv Morgan, somebody pulled up. Oh, my goodness. She's actually been featured in some of Liv Morgan's Instagram or uh Snapchat or whatever it was, but there was actually four different pictures that were shown where Lana and Liv, they actually know each other and they kind of show themselves very friendly. You know, you can take it as you want. Morgan, whose real name is Gianna Jean Daddio, has apparently been on TV since proposing a gimmick change following her loss to Charlotte Flair. And the vignettes we started seeing proclaimed that one person in particular changed her forever. Now we know it's Lana. 
So I can imagine Sonya being upset. That's fine. And other people just saying, you know, lesbians on television or lesbians in real life, it's, it's just a normal thing. Yes, you're right. But, you know, there's not much of a payoff you could put on this storyline because you already have, you've already had the the affair, the divorce. Then you decided to go with the wedding, and you're just kind of trudging along with the storyline. I don't want a mixed tag team match. And Lashley and Rusev really have nothing to go ahead and fight each other about. Really? I mean, why is it that Rusev continues to want to attack Lashley? They haven't finished. I mean, what, what feud is there left? If he says, take her, you can have her, then what's the whole story about? I mean, I don't know. Did everybody do their job in the storyline to trying to like get the, get the angle over? Yes, absolutely. Rusev kind of struggled getting out of the cake. Last year was serviceable. Lana did her best to make the storyline get over. The preacher was good. I mean, they did it. They put it by the numbers, and people watched. So it was a Jerry Springer moment. And it still works in 2019 and now 2020. And I think people were really upset about that because of the fact that we're seeing another re- re- wedding storyline and everybody's crapping it as the worst thing to ever do to end the decade, blah, 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 blah. But they're missing the point. The real fact of the matter is what I said on Twitter. Let me just read it for you. I said, tonight, WWE jumped the shark. I said this on Twitter after Raw. Creative just landed an all-time rock bottom main event moment because everybody just crapped on it. I mean, the, the negativity of the storyline was there, but again, it was salacious. It was tabloidistic. It was something that was going to get some storylines. People were going to talk about it because they saw it on TV, and they did, and the ratings reflected it. So again, another Lana Rusev Lashley storyline at the end of the night Brought in viewers. People were watching it. People are into it. You can't deny that. And just because maybe some of those people are not as vocal on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or whatever to talk about it, the the diehard fans and the podcasters out there, they're going to continue to get us bash away. But getting back to my tweet, my set of tweets. But hey, NXT's winning the war on Wednesday nights over AEW, right? This is where we're supposed to be arguing with WWE in 2020. But, hey, go ahead and brag about NXT being AEW, right? WWE is the major leagues, right? Every star that hasn't had a relevant career unless they've been in WWE, right? Give me a break. My point is, is that people want to go ahead and attack the storyline, which is indicative of the storylines that we see in and WWE Creative. This is their example of a woven, detailed storyline that they've taken a lot of time to tell. This is a storyline they're actually telling a story. You know, they brought in extra pieces to the puzzle. There's a lot of people involved in this. And they have definitely blocked out some major angles in between. Because remember, this is not with a big angle in the beginning and a big angle in the end. No. This has been going on throughout. This has been going on throughout the the last, what, three months? And we haven't had a match to pay off the the feud yet. I think, what was it? We're going to have one. Oh, no. uh, No, we haven't had one yet. And so we don't know when that match is going to actually happen, if they're going to actually have it at all. So what have they accomplished so far before I move into my main point? The angle establishes Lana as a real super heel because now she's hated. She's not Vicky Guerrero hated, but she's hated. Like she's over as a heel now and that's good for whatever she wants to do. So she's only with Rusev and she accompanies Bobby Lashley. That's probably not a bad thing, but Bobby Lashley, they need to move off of the storyline and get Bobby Lashley into the ring and start doing stuff with Lana as the valet. Okay, done. Let's work with that. But again, let them go on their honeymoon, move away, come back later, and then we put them in somewhere and incorporate them into the storyline somewhere else. Somewhere else with somebody else. Rusev, 
I think is irrelevant out of all of this because rele- I mean, really, Rusev means nothing now. So he won because he's liberated from Lana. Other than that, what else has he done? He hasn't accomplished anything. A couple of attacks on Lashley, that's it. The crowd's going to chant Rusev's day no matter what, because that's all they're going to do. But are they really going to get behind him? Probably not. But he's just the antagonist in this storyline, and that was it. And Liv Morgan, I don't know what to think. I mean, she's back, but this can't be the reason for the only storyline that she has. Oh, she's a lesbian now. We have to do something else here. I don't know what that's going to be, but anyways. Yeah, it's interesting that you got Sandy and uh, excuse me, Mandy and Sandy, Mandy and Sonya over on SmackDown. They get to see what's going on here on the other brand. When I kept hearing things that Mandy and Sonya might actually have kind of a tryst that might break them up at some point, but nothing has happened there either. And I can understand Sonya Deville or Daria Baronado being sensitive to the subject because of her real stance is and how a storyline is being brought in for this storyline to go ahead and bring in a lesbian Trist. It's nothing new. I mean, the same thing where we had Mickey James and Trish Stratus, same story, but that was 20 years ago here. It's what it is. And the fans that are out there that are very vocal keyboard warriors, all of you, I'm not afraid to say that it's true. Many of you are keyboard warriors. You're going to go ahead and talk about it. And even the podcasters can go ahead and talk about it. But I'm going to say some of them are not going to be responding back on Twitter or anywhere else if somebody comes back and, you know, confronts. I'm not here to name names, but it's true. Some people will take, you know, because there are certain people that are trying to debate these podcasters. And the truth is they're just not, they're not informative. They don't have a history to, to watch the business like that. Like maybe like someone like me, I'm not saying I'm the most well run and most informative. No, but I've seen enough to know what's going on. And, you know, I mean, with WWE doing what they did fine. Listen, it's their style, but obviously the fans don't like this style anymore. They don't want the attitude era to just be rehashed. They want a new attitude all together and to see some new stars come into the fold. They want an NXT attitude era. I get it. And so do you see anybody on the NXT roster right now of, of the people that were given awards on the NXT program tonight, any one of them stand out to you as absolutely positively going to break the bank in, 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 in the main roster? Any of them look at the ones that we were praising back in NXT before Alistair Black Listen, great match with Buddy Murphy. It's a feud that people can talk about. It's it's a nugget that people that some of the diehard fans are getting to appreciate. Andrade and his feud with Rey Mysterio. That's another one that you know the, the diehard fans. That's like a that's a crumb for the fans to enjoy. But meanwhile, WWE is worrying about other things. They're worrying more about oh, we're going to build up Drew McIntyre. Maybe he's going to be a future opponent for Brock Lesnar. We're going to build up Seth Rollins and Authors of Pain. Eventually, Roman Reigns is going to get us come up. It's on Baron Corbin and move forward and maybe become a champion again. Brock Lesnar comes back into the story, and we don't know what he's going to be doing next or who he's going to be facing. But WrestleMania season's coming back next week, and that'll get everybody all happy, happy. Royal Rumble time will get everybody all up. So the outrage that happened tonight will be for nothing. It'll be a one-shot, one-week news cycle. That's it. There will not be anything else said about this next week. I can almost guarantee it. So what should we learn from this? Well, when WrestleMania or Royal Rumble are not in the crosshairs for WWE, when they have to go ahead and live on their own laurels without any pay-per-views to build up to or anything else to build up to, which is what they've done since TLC came and went because TLC was just a throw-in throw in pay-per-view that didn't really matter. 
Survivor Series was also kind of just a throw-in pay-per-view. The next invasion, that meant nothing because nobody really came above that. It was just an exposure for NXT to get a little bump in their ratings. That's all it was. But otherwise, what has been done on the main roster during the offseason to really build things up? No, there's not a thing. Again, when Paul Heyman and Eric Bischoff were brought on the executive direct, they were trying to go ahead and get things back, get the ship back where it was. And a little shuffling of the lineup has stabilized the product. But there are still some nights where they're not doing well on Mondays and Friday nights. SmackDown now is stable. You know, they're pulling 2.4 million viewers. That's still not great, but it's solid now. And they're probably getting more viewers from the DVR ratings. We talked about that. So that's where they are. There's probably a chance with WrestleMania season that the ratings can go back up to three. And also they've been uncontested because they haven't had any new programming on the major networks for a few weeks now because the November sweeps ended. So SmackDown is uncontested. And they've only been able to pull 2.4 million ratings. When you look at the last... Well, yeah, look at the last uh, ratings that they moved over. You know, they got 2.6 on November 18th. And that was the NXT angle. Then after Survivor Series, drop. 2.3, 2.4, 2.3, 2.4. That's it. So not much of a difference. Just barely a smidgen above what they were doing on USA. That's it. That's where they are. So what it's worth, things are stabilized. There's obviously going to be the WrestleMania bump that will come in. WrestleMania season is here. Things will kind of change around. That'll be good for them. And then what else are they going to do? Again, there is room for all elite wrestling to grow. They have the best chance to grow. NXT, I can't see them growing their audience much more above close to a million viewers for any hot shot booking to do, they could put a takeover on on a Wednesday night like they do now, and they're still only going to tail off at 850,000. Remember, when they had the hot shot booking going on prior to Survivor Series, you had 957,000, and those are the couple of weeks that they actually beat. And remember, those are the couple of weeks that they actually beat AEW in the ratings on Wednesday nights. Because when you look at it, After Survivor Series, NXT pulled 810,000 to 633,000 for Dynamite. Then AEW took it back with a slight margin on December 2nd. December 9th, a tie, virtual tie. December 16th, NXT wins. And again, Uncontested with no AEW, NXT pulled 831,000 viewers. There you go. But again, that's probably what they're only going to pull. I mean, they've only pulled a million viewers the first two weeks uncontested. Otherwise, that's as high as they're going to get. But AEW, they could get themselves back up. I mean, they did have a good audience that showed up initially, but then trying to pull them up and try to get them going forward, you have to wait. So... It's going to take some time for AEW to kind of build things back up. They could get their ratings back up a bit. They have room to grow. They could build some stars. NXT, I I believe they are at a ceiling. Because there's not much you can do right now with NXT to build the Undisputed Era or Damian Priest or Keith Lee or Donovan Djokovic or Killian Dane or Damian Priest. Think about it. There's a lot of guys there. Great stars, talented, Rhea Ripley, Shayna Baszler. But again, what's going to pull people over and ultimately get a million viewers on that show? Unless you start putting more main roster stars onto that show. But I don't think they're going to do that. WrestleMania is too important. They have to focus on the two shows on Friday and Monday. So no changes have happened. Another offseason that should have benefited from the change of channels. Nothing happened. Instead, as we always talk about, the ratings started going back down again. 
Now, it'll be interesting if Raw can get back to where they were last year, where they were pulling 2.8 to nearly 3 million viewers any given week. You know, SmackDown Live, right prior to WrestleMania, was able to pull up around 2.4 million viewers. What they're doing now. That's telling you they have not made any changes in the TV product that have been significant enough to get them going. First of all, what they did was they had a slide and they re, re recovered. That's what they did. Is that really helpful? Does it really uh, do a lot for people? Does it really impress anybody when it comes to ratings at all? And to think, man, you look at the ratings at, at, in twenty. 18, and you look back at the ratings that they had as well. I mean, besides the fact that Raw would pull under 2 million viewers the last two weeks of the year, that's customary. Year to year, they actually pulled, again, almost 500,000 viewers back from the previous week. But then at the time, when you look at Raw two years ago, WrestleMania season time, 3.2 to 4.5 million viewers. Man. I remember one of those was the Raw 25th anniversary, and they pulled 4.5. They can't even pull that now. But they have continued to see a dwindling of the ratings. And and again, the SummerSlam slide every year happens, and it looks so bad. And so AEW really did not affect them at all. The only the slide that AEW's you know the, the Really, the slide that WWE is dealing with right now is of their own ilk. Their problem. They're to blame. But again, the fans are so happy about a slight win every week over AEW. Or sometimes they get a little more than a couple hundred thousand viewers. Okay, I'll give them that. But again, a show with a ceiling that cannot reach over a million viewers. I don't see it. I don't think that we're going to do to make NXT get over a million viewers not the way it is. I mean, are they even moving out on the road or is it still going to be in the NXT arena? I don't know. For all the wrestling, again, they can build themselves up. They're building stars now. They're trying. I give them some credit. I think they've had some bumps in the road and they, they're they trying to figure things out. I think they're listening to their fans and they're trying to respond. And somebody's going to come across and become a couple of big draw stars besides Chris Jericho that are going to be over the top going to get this show on the road and get AW on the map with a significant audience. I don't know what to do to get that there, but you take a little taste of the old school. That's what you have Arn Anderson now head coaching Cody. You're doing the legends of wrestling deal for Memphis where well, they're going on to Memphis, Tennessee next week. And you know, they're trying to get a little bit of old, new factions here. A little bit of a factor now, which is good. MJF is a monster heel right now. John Moxley is a star. They're doing some things right in all elite wrestling. And the most important thing is the diehard WWE fans. You know, they are upset. And they are spewing hatred on AEW fans. And listen, AEW's got their share of white knights too. But to be so upset and to be so angered and you know, so encumbered as to what's going on here with that company, which really has nothing to do with WWE, really. I mean, how often do they really go ahead and pick on the other company? They haven't done that lately. They've kind of left that alone. Now, People were talking about the Ford GTO that Chris Jericho ran, uh, drove off in. I don't know if that meant anything about the whole John Cena thing, which is a, a subtle shot. I don't know. But the company has storylines, and they actually have some pretty detailed storylines so far and some pretty detailed feuds, so I can't knock them for that. Meanwhile... WWE is doing the most limited storylines possible. I mean, you do have a story with Bray Wyatt and Daniel Bryan, but they haven't told the story as to how they want to go ahead and tell the Daniel Wyatt story. 
they don't want to talk about that yet, which they've obviously done a little tease of it when you see the montages, the couple of flashes of footage, which is Bray Wyatt saying that he was, my, he was his friend. So they talked about that. But then again, nothing since. You know, they have not decided to build that story up yet. I don't know when they're going to have that match, if it's going to be built up till later. But if they're going to build that up to WrestleMania, I guess it's a story they're going to leave for WrestleMania. But they cannot just leave stuff for WrestleMania season. And now, again, we always hear about this. And then I won't forget last year. Remember, we had, we're going to give you what you want. You remember all the McMahons coming out, saying that at the end of 2018, then they had to change and welch on their promise to the fans. But the fans are so so spread out and so mixed and so disheveled on their opinions. The one thing they could do for sure is shit on AEW and neglect the major independents that are actually doing great work, doing yeoman's work right now. When I look at 2020, NWA is kicking ass right now. I love what they're doing right now. I think they have some of the best characters developed right now in the, of any company. Period. I mean, Aaron Stevens and the question mark make me laugh every time I see him on TV. I'm interested by the Marty Bell, Allison K, that whole storyline with the factions. And obviously they're trying to build more stuff. They have Power Surge, Girl Power, whatever else is going on. They got another pay-per-view, Hard Times coming up. Is it the same weekend as the Royal Rumble? I think it is. And there you have it. You know, we have all that to talk about. And then you look at Impact Wrestling, also having a very good year. I still have to finish watching the last episode that was live. And, of course, remember, in two weeks we have their pay-per-view hard to kill in 11 days as I record this, or 10 days. So that's coming up. It's great stuff going on right now. On those sides... And the Ring of Honor, well, I mean, they're trying to keep some people back on the team. They're trying to keep Shane Taylor on board. Matt Taven's hurt. I mean, other things that are going on. You know, they're in a struggling moment. Ring of Honor's in a, in a rough shape. And I don't know what they're going to do to get themselves out of their rut. But, you know, Final Battle wasn't a bad pay-per-view. I didn't think it was that bad. I've talked about that. And that's the overall spectrum of wrestling right now. And MLW is doing really good, too. I'm enjoying their stuff, obviously. So, we still, and I'm, I'm please remember, I'm trying to get this point ground around you people, uh, all you fans out there that listen to the show, and maybe get this word out to the others, to explain the fact that you have to see the bigger picture. Overall, the fight for the wrestlers to get over and for the wrestlers to get their comeuppance and get their due when they are worthy of being on the main roster of WWE and they're getting thrown into bad storylines and bad angles and all this kind of stuff, you know, at this moment, a lot of established stars are the ones that are up in the front of the establishment when it comes to the storylines they're talking about. I mean, you have, again, Lana, Rusev, Lashley have been around for a number of years. What, about five, six years now? Seth Rollins has been around for, you know, almost a decade. The O'Brien, Bray Wyatt, been around for a long time. Kevin Owens, some of Joe, a bunch of veterans, by the way. you got a lot of older stars at the very top. And so Alistair Black and Ricochet, no matter how many years in the business they've been in, you know, they're looked at as, you know, rookies, y- young guys, kids in the back. So neglect of their complete careers before they got here, right? We all talk about that. We know that. And then you get to where we are now, and I'm like, you know, what are they really doing to build out stars? Who are they trying to, you know, reposition to really get over big and become big stars? There are certain people that are only going to be at that world title level. And when you think about nobody complains enough about Brock Lesnar being away for months at a time, and so since the Intercontinental title is over on the SmackDown side, the U.S. title is given much more stature. To where Seth Rollins even went ahead and went after 
the belt for a title shot. And the year before, Seth Rollins was Intercontinental Champion because, again, Brock Lesnar's away. WWE has continued to fail in fixing their part-time problems. They continue to fail in trying to build their product with new stars that are going to get over big. Every NXT prospect has come in and crashed and burned. You have stopped and started Aleister Black. Ricochet is now in the middle of the pack. Heavy machinery is just a gimmick. Braun Strowman, last we saw him, was dancing. This company, the commitment they give to their stars is really bad. And the path that each of these superstars have to take and remember, if they're towing the company line or not, you know, why even do it when you know you're going to get blown up? You're going to be put in a bad storyline. Part of the reason is because, again, we have an Olympic Village. Look, Charlotte and Andrade are engaged, right? So Andrade, he's never going to leave that company if he's got Charlotte to decide, Right? I mean, think about it. Becky and Seth, you'll never see them leave. You got all these different multi deal contracts and all, and all these stars that are hooking up with each other in Olympic Village style, and that's it. Yeah, that's what's normally going to happen. And that's all they're going to do. And then the comments that are being made about the storylines that are happening here that people are talking about. The backstage reaction from Vince McMahon about the lesbian angle. According to a WWE source, according to WrestlingNews.co, Vince was very happy with how everything played out in the show. Vince was wanted to do more crazy stories like this, but he has to do balance things out and satisfy the people at USA Network and the sponsors. He got what he wanted. The overrun did nice numbers, and he's in a good mood. Then they also said, and the same source says, that the storyline with Rusev, Bobby Lashley, Lana, and Liv Morgan is nowhere near its end. And it could run to WrestleMania. Vince loves his story storyline so much, he's open to more off the wall ideas. Some more Jerry Springer stuff coming could be happening. Basically, basically, it's almost as if Vince Russo's back. Vince, at this point, and Paul Heyman in the same way. They only know what they've done on a larger scale, and they're not willing to go ahead and move everything out at all. Now, the YouTube numbers are also good. The edited segment on the YouTube, 3.5 million viewers. The post-show video, 2.5 million people. And now, WWE doesn't have to worry about Monday Night Football, and they got WrestleMania season coming up. So they're going to be good with that. They're actually holding up right now, and they're they're going to actually survive the off season. So people are not going to talk about this so much. So what? Bobby Lashley was with Justin Barrasso, of Sports Illustrated. He talked about a couple different topics. He talked about the storyline with Lana Rusev. And that. When Lashley and Lana got married on television, he said, yes, I've experienced a tremendous amount of hate. We as a society come out and we're anti-bullying, anti-hate, anti-this, anti-that. But I think we actually pick and choose who we hate and bully. Because everybody still knows me and knows what I do and what I'm capable of doing, what I've done in my career as far as the military, being a single father, putting myself through college, graduating with honors, and I can keep going. But I received a tremendous amount of hate here across the board, personally, for the things that I guess I do. It's all over the board. It's from the fact that this is an interracial because I've had guys saying the N-word to me and I'm going to kill you. We're going to get you when you come down south. I just kind of sit back and laugh about it. I've even experienced some people that are in the business of wrestling tweeting things and posting pictures. And I just sit back and laugh. A lot of times we feel that the person being hated or on or being bullied should be a frail person. But now you take somebody like myself and Lana, who's a gorgeous woman, and we don't look like the typical people who are bullied. I'm glad I have thick skin because if I didn't, some of the things I've had to experience would be very difficult to take. Well, again, when you bring back a Bobby Lashley to this company, 
Look at what they've done with him. Bringing out his sisters or supposed sisters for a storyline with Sami Zayn. Then we moved on to Leo Rush, a company Bobby Lashley. To where we are now. Oh, to Strowman running Lashley through the video board. Again, Lashley, they're trying to make attempts with, but this is the best they can do with him. Meanwhile, look at how they booked him in Impact Wrestling. MMA guy, fighter, you know, he was he was badass. And it was more about his in-ring stuff, not this bullshit they're doing right now with this guy. It's indicative. Look at what they're doing with Roman Reigns. It's not about the matches. It's not about the in-ring work. Him and the dog food and the dog, 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 this and that. Why does it matter? And why aren't people talking more about this? But again, this is the WWE map. They do all this stuff. People will be outraged. And then all of a sudden, Brock comes back next week. They'll have other stuff. They might have more of the storyline going on. Whatever. They might do more with it. I don't know. CM Punk, by the way, made content on, made a uh, comments. Excuse me on the ba- the backstage show on FS1. Now he wasn't on backstage, but he did say that on Twitter, WWE needs to hire people who actually understand what representation means to the audience that they're trying to reach. But what do I know? I'm a bear. I suck the heads off a fish. And there we go. So they're doing what they're doing, and people are being completely distracted. And they on purpose are doing that. The fans are on purpose deciding we're just going to deny. Yeah, we're going to complain about certain things, but we're not going to really push and prod this company to make significant changes or show real protest and do something with our dollars or subscriptions or anything like that. Because nobody's going to do that. The fans stick with the status quo. That's the way they want it. And why? Why do the fans allow themselves to go ahead and just criticize? And now they just say, well, we're just going to go and bash the other company that came as a result of a movement and a revolution against this very thing they didn't want to be a part of. Is all elite wrestling ever going to do like a wedding angle like this? Ask yourself the question, who else does this? Anybody else doing anything like this? I mean, Impact Wrestling had a wedding angle, a little bit different. They didn't do it in the ring like like WWE has to do everything in the ring, right? Think about it. As we always talk about, everything's done in ring. Contract signings in the ring. Weddings angles in the ring. It's the same thing over and over. There's no change to it. Oh, we can't pre-tape stuff. Oh, we can't put this. No, we have to do it on stage like it's Broadway. It's actually got to happen there. And then and the acting's got to be on point. It's got to be done live. Really? Look at all that, folks. But again, the fans will not say a word about it. They're going to stifle themselves about it. They would rather bash AEW. And look, NXT, NXT. We're happy about NXT. Oh, and the Major League thing. When I hear about that. Listen, and again, I'm not going to mention names. But this is the kind of mentality that some fans and podcasters have. Where they want to go ahead and complain, oh, well, who are you? You were never in in WWE. I don't care if you were in Impact Wrestling, Ring of Honor, any other company. You could have been in Bodunk County Wrestling. I wouldn't give a shit about you. I wouldn't give a fuck about you, right? So fans, you know... Very elitist attitude to have. Really. It's funny how the culture changes here where people are like, oh, we're complaining about sectional- or intersectionality and PC stuff and, you know, diversity. Like that actually is part of the audience is actually giving a shit about that. And then you have a company that's actually trying to do that in AEW. Trying to make good on what WWE is not doing and giving a place for stars to 
hone their craft and be able to do something. Is it perfect? No. But it's they're making a good effort. And they put a dent and, and they actually got noticed. An audience has been watching them. Bigger than anybody else is for the other products out there, for the other major independents. As far as I know, yeah, New Japan wants to go and come in and infiltrate the U.S. AAA wants to infiltrate the U.S. Well, what are we hearing about that? Not much, not much really dented at all from those guys. You know, New Japan on the G1 Supercard, I hadn't heard much about New Japan in the American sense at all. Not really. And the relationship with the Ring of Honor obviously changed things. But when I look at all of it, the fans are, if you're not about the WWE, then it's bust. It's like, don't talk to me about another company. Don't talk to me about anything else. And this is where, and I'm, I'm just going to say it, okay? Listen, I, it doesn't matter about the audience. You know, if there's going to be people out there, they're going to be upset by my comments. But I am sitting out here without trying to pick one side because I don't need to. You know Why? Because there is a phrase for someone like me. I'm a nonconformist. We're not in the playground here. This is not recess. I am not going to go ahead and start saying, oh, well, I need to go ahead and be cool and peer pressure as a motherfucker. And I need to go ahead and start talking good about WWE or crapping on WWE when everybody else is allowed to, right? There's actually like a click out there that's like, oh, you're not allowed to go and say anything. And God forbid you stay on the fence or you're on the other side and you're an AEW fan. Because you're just picked on and just ridiculed, right? You see it. Oh, if you're not talking about NXT being cool, then there's something wrong with you. Can't say anything about that. No, no. Oh, God forbid we say anything bad about WWE. Oh, and, you know, and the Daniel Bryan, we wouldn't give a fuck about what he did in Ring of Honor. Who cares? It means nothing. You know, oh, he, he trained with Shawn Michaels. But, you know, those first 10 years or 12 years of his career... They don't mean anything. Oh, you won Ring of Honor World Title several times. You, you won it, you know. You were a Triple Crown Champion, things like that. No, we don't care. Kevin Owens Triple Crown Champ. No, we don't care. AJ Styles was phenomenal before he came to WWE when he was like basically the face of TNA. Same thing for Samoa Joe. You know, ten year careers plus. We're not going to talk about that. We don't care. In their world, is revisionist culture. And they just don't care. Gals and Anderson come in out of Japan. Nobody cares about that. The whole Finn Bauer Bullet Club thing. Nobody cares about that. If WWE didn't do it, it's as if Vince has told people, you better not say anything about those other companies or else I'm going to disown you. Like It's like really the thought process of people that want to just go ahead and crap. And I'm sorry, man. There are podcasters that... They are acting like bullies themselves. Do I care that they're acting like bullies? No, because they're going to do it anyway. I'm not going to be the one that's going to call them out. Fuck it. But what I do know is they're doing this. And God forbid they're allowed to like, you know, there's like a purists kind of society. God forbid somebody else puts a little stain on the glorious puritanistic white as a sheet WWE product. Oh, God forbid anybody else is allowed to go ahead and criticize the company or anybody else is allowed to create an organization that's directly against the whole notion of how the corporate society of WWE is done. Where nobody's talking about the Olympic Village type mentality where WWE has created the environment so that, okay, you're amongst these all these other hot people. Oh, you know, there might have been a thing where, you know, you don't commingle. There's no co-ed type of uh, situation amongst the talent like the locker rooms are separate and there's no kind of morality clause now because they're all independent contractors so now you know if you did hook up with somebody on the roster that was something that was different but now it's accepted it's actually i feel like it's being encouraged nobody said a thing about charlotte and andrade right selena vega and alistair black lana and rusev think about it Nobody's saying anything about all this stuff. Bianca Belair, Montez Ford. Think about it. Nobody's saying a thing about all these stars. And so they're more concerned about their paychecks, I would imagine. 
and their relationships. Because I'm not saying that their focus is completely away from it. But there's a different story when you are on your own and you're hungry and you don't have anybody else in your way that you're looking to support. You're doing it on your own and you're trying to make a big name for yourself. And you marry outside of the gimmick, right? Kevin Owens is married outside of his thing. Randy Orton is also married outside of his uh, normal setup. Never married. I don't know if he had any hookups within the company, things like that. John Cena, I don't know if he was directly affected from his thing with Nikki Bella. I don't see that either. But think about all of that. It's allowed. It's a sick, twisted corporate culture in there. And the creative that's being done, you got a bunch of frat boys out there that they don't know anything else. Again, it's funny when Vince Russo was talking about a wrestling bubble. He's right. The Jerry Springer stuff. So Vince, this is the idea of the Attitude Era stuff he wanted to bring back. Okay. There's probably going to be a bit of an audience that comes back to watch it, but not that big of an audience, right? You're not going to do any much difference. And again, you're not building new stars. So gimmicks and hot shot booking are not the answer. And NXT, they don't have the resources on the money or the, the budget or the things they can do inside of the NXT arena to really make stars super big. I love how people want to go ahead and say Rhea Ripley's the next big thing. You know, I, I would love to go and think that. But do you really believe that's going to be true? I mean, do you really see Keith Lee when he moves up to that main roster? Oh, I just can't wait till he gets to that main roster. I can't wait till she gets to that main roster. Can't wait for Shayna Baszler to move up there. Right? And what are they going to do? That's different than what Lacey Evans went through. Or what's different from Aleister Black or Ricochet? Tell me. Convince me. Do you know something that about Vince and, and Kevin Dunn and Paul Heyman and all those people in the uh, and Bruce Pritchard? Do you know something that I don't know? I mean, I follow the same news stories all of you do. It's the same bullshit over and over. Corporate culture. And all of you bite on this like a bunch of posers. And I'm not trying to put you all down because you're posers. Because, oh, my God, we got, it's like people that are posers in Miami and South Florida here. Oh, you got to be wearing Gucci. You got to have your Louis Vuitton bag. You got your Gucci belt. You got to be wearing, you know, all the right threads. You got to have the right look. You got to wear your skinny jeans just right. You got to have all the tattoos in the right places. Have your hair all dolled up, whatever, red, green, yellow, purple. You got to be at the right restaurants, the right places, hanging out with the right people can't stand that shit i can't stand it and that's what's going on now there's an in crowd the podcasters are part of that the fans are part of that the wrestlers are part of that in crowd well i don't want to be in the in crowd i've never been part of the in crowd i'm not one of those people that i need to go ahead and like kiss up to anybody because i'm looking to go and get free tickets to a, a, a wwe event or to go to some show or to try to get interviews with stars. I'm not doing that. I've been offered. I don't take them. I don't need that. It's not what the show's about. This show is consistently about the same thing I've been talking about for now. I've been doing this for, this is my eighth year. And I'm still 500 plus episodes. And I'm still thumping the same subject. I am here for the wrestling, for the wrestling stars. To see them get their comeuppance and get bigger and better. And the best thing that ever happened was to see all these other companies sprouting up and giving people work. It's nice to see NWA giving Trevor Murdoch and Eli Drake, Nick Aldis, James Storm, Colt Cabana, Ken Anderson, the question mark, Aaron Stevens, Allison Kay, Molina, Marty Bell, Ashley Vox, Tasha Steeles, and what have you. I love that all these stars are getting some place to go work. Sam McCallahan, Tessa Blanchard, Brian Cage, follow up on all these stars that are going on in other companies. MLW, you got, you know, Tom Lawler and Brian Pillman and the Contra Union and all this stuff. And the, and the Von Ericks. I love that all these people are out there. And I love that the AEW folks, they gave room. Because look, man, maybe not Joey Janela and Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus. And Orange Cassidy is not 
not something you'd be into, but I can enjoy it. I can appreciate what they're doing. It's something different, something, you know, it's quirky, it's goofy, it's off the walls, nerdy, and that's fine. So AEW fans are not part of the in crowd because they don't want to be in the in crowd either. That's why I can un- empathize with them. I empathize with the other major independent supporters. I empathize with them. But what I want my brothers on the other side that are completely, honestly, delusional WWE fans that are so, they're, they, they're you know, who was that said the phrase horse blinders? That was Trevor Murdoch. Yes, all of you are wearing, bl- I've said this before on this program, that some of you are in a bubble wearing horse blinders. That you cannot look at other wrestling companies and what other wrestling organizations were out there when there was a territory system way before you grew up, which I remembered. It was fun and great. We had all these different organizations out there. And some people don't want to be in that. I understand, you know, but wrestling is good when you have a territory type system. A TV territory type system is great. So much great wrestling to watch on YouTube. And so many great pay-per-views to watch every year. Now, look at think of all the hey, pay-per-views we get now. And we also don't even get them every month like WWE does, right? When we look at AEW, four a year. NWA, maybe like six. I don't know how many they're going to do now per year. Impact does four a year. MLW is starting to do a couple now. And I love it. All of it. It's great. And people need to understand that we're getting all this now. We're getting blessed with all this great wrestling, all these great stars. And then what happens when some star... And by the way, have we seen any other stars make their way over to WWE as of late? Ask yourself the question in 2020, is there going to be anybody jumping ship? Marty Skrull hasn't. Have you heard about anybody else? Preparing to jump ship except John Morrison? Who else have we heard about that's going to make their way back over? What I think in 2020 is going to happen is we're going to see some stars make their way out. Listen, WWE is going to go ahead and sign some of their stars back like they're always going to do. That's good. But again, we look at the same thing over and over. What's going to happen after all this is said and done? When you look at the expiration dates of all the stars. Well, let me go and pull that list one more time up. Keep it in mind, Matt Hardy's contract ends March. Revival, April. Mandy Rose is ending at the end of this year. Rey Mysterio, October. And Jeff Hardy could also be gone as well with Matt, and they might also be gone. So there's still stars there, and there's other other stars that might move over. To AEW or another organization, we might see some switching around. That could very well happen. Keep that all in mind. Now, I'll tell you one thing. If we can see NWA continue to build up what they're doing, because I think they're the, they're the company that has the best chance to grow in 2020. Impact Wrestling the same way. I love what they're doing right now in Impact. MLW do great stuff as well. So there's room for all the major dependents to grow, except for Ring of Honor. They need to find their way back. I don't know what that's going to be, but they need to continue to rebuild. They need to find some stars. They need to find something to get them off the funk because they're in a bad spot. I think that without any kind of backing up, I would think Ring of Honor would be best served if Sinclair Broadcasting decided to sell the product and merge it with somebody else. That would actually be a pretty nice thing to see if that were to happen. I think Sinclair could be best served by letting that company go. Letting somebody else own it. Maybe something will happen. I don't know. But it's not a good place. And maybe there's not room for Ring of Honor. Because really, who's talking about them? There's not much being said. So keep that all in mind. I just want the fans out there to stop being posers. Please start. I don't expect you to show respect to the other companies. But you know what? If you're going to go and start complaining about anything, I don't care about you going to pick on everybody else and shitting on everybody else. But you know what? If you're going to be in a shitty mood and you're going to continue to criticize and be negative and 
you're just going to be Debbie Downers out there. If that's what you want to be, then please take the same energy you put out to go ahead and shit on the AEW fans, the major independent fans, and every other wrestling fan that doesn't agree with you. Take your fucking vitriol and put it towards the main company because that's where your arguments really should be. Quit attacking each other. If you're going to go ahead and attack each other, then go ahead and take your arguments, take it up with the main company, and really go after them and get your fans to do the same thing. I'm telling it to all the other podcasters out there. Do that. Make it a point. All right, we'll leave it there. So again, next week, we'll go ahead and do a little preview predictions for Hard to Kill. I'll get a chance to watch that final episode from a couple weeks ago for Impact so I can get all set up for that. And then we'll go ahead and check out what happens after SmackDown and Raw when we now know that WrestleMania season is upon us. And now we'll see what they're going to do for Rumble time. Obviously, people will start listening to wrestling again, getting all caught up into it. After the holidays, obviously, Royal Rumble, WrestleMania season gets people all jacked up. So it'll be nice to see the company actually making an effort for the next four months. But again, it's best that this company gets real criticism from this audience, from these fans out there. The Poser fans should also be doing the same thing. Because most importantly, you might have a voice out there much bigger than me. Please, use your voice for something good. Attack WWE when they're doing stuff wrong and continue to push on it. And if you got fans who are in the stands, please make it known that you're not happy with the product. And detest what they're doing. Yeah, sure. Pay your tickets. Buy your tickets. Do what you got to do. But really, let's get on this company. Change things around. New decade. New fight. I hope all, everyone does that. So anyway, we'll come back for another Wrestling is Real podcast next week because wrestling needs us. Thank you for listening to the Wrestling is Real podcast brought to you by KingofAmazon.com. Help support the King of Podcasts. Shop now at KingofAmazon.com.